And uh, well, as host just uh, introduced, of course, it's uh, it's uh, how to say very no particular moment also for me because of course I've been uh, I've been working uh, with him since uh, eighty four. So of course uh, it's uh, let's say it's not easy. And um, just a second because I want to just. Uh, Second, I need something here. Just a second. Okay. It's not easy. And uh, uh, as Horst <laughs> mentioned, I thought about the enthusiasm of Ricardo. And of course, this is, uh, let's say, yes, it's a counterpart of a rather, uh, let's say, complicated and difficult personality also. And uh, so when I was preparing this talk to be very sincere, I had a strange feeling because I'm saying, well, before, <laughs> even say for changing a sentence in a paper, there was always a big quarrel, struggle for everything because I also I'm a very critical person, sometimes a little boring, and he was always overreacting. So it was just very difficult to do, I mean, just, but, but he listened. So listen, so I could, in the end, there was a reply, but maybe two days later, after, I know, getting angry or something like that. So it was very, a very rich for me, but rather complex. And now, now I have the right to do anything. I'm here, I've selected material. I'm going to say what I think is a sort of red thread. I'm quoting, I let, I let him speak because I, you see, I selected arbitrarily a few sentences. So it's a very strange feeling. Of course, in a sense, I'm very relieved. He cannot tell me anything. Ah, that's beautiful, I think. They're very relaxed. On the other hand, while preparing that, of course, I have always uh, the feeling of being of betraying him since the first slide. Because just because for him, everything was, you know, very well thought, very, it was sort of harmonious, you know? And uh, you couldn't touch one thing without touching the other. But I made a choice. I'm going to talk about mostly about physics. I might have tried to, to do something very different, but instead I thought it's, I mean, to me, I think it's more fair. So I'm, I'm going, of course, to, to outline some themes. And in this respect, you have also to consider that he has written about 500 papers, has written six books. And I've counted more or less, yes, uh, co-authored uh, papers with about 150 theorists and, and many, many experimentalists. So, of course, it's a very huge, I mean, it goes without saying, it's my choice. And uh, I have to be very superficial, but that goes without saying that uh, you have to bear with me. So it's, uh, I will start for, uh, I don't know if one can, uh, can we talk? No, this we cannot eliminate. Yeah? Or what can we? We should move it or we just, sorry. Okay. Okay. So I think that we start, oh, we start from as usual, from the fact that he was from um, 39. He was an Argentinian uh, born in Cordoba, always uh, very attached, I think, to his own country, of which he knew a new and underlined in many defects, or many times said, oh, you Italians, you should not behave as Argentinians, that he kept saying many times. But uh, he, he studied in this beautiful place. This, of course, is just from today, but you see, uh, you want, do you want to leave a scientific adventure in Patagonia? This Bariloche is a famous place in Argentina, very beautiful sort of Dolomites there. And uh, so he graduated in, uh, in uh, 65, and they went to do his PhD under Daniel Vess. Let's see how we recall it. I think it just let him speak. He said, I went to Buenos Aires to do my doctoral thesis with Daniel Vess, who had just returned from the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen after 10 years. In his luggage, in addition to porcelain from Congelic fabric, he carried three or four central problems on nuclear physics of the time. He had worked very much on Elliot Moore, the Shell Moore, the SD, and uh, uh, interactions. Okay? Problems that in less than uh, two years, a group of four very young people, Zucca, Federman, Makeda, Broglia, have solved. And now the central point, have solved in a continuous discussion and open to all members of the group. 
so open that we often forgot to whom the research topic under discussion belonged. Typical of this magical atmosphere of a high level school is the fact that I wrote Makeda's doctoral thesis and he wrote mine. The assignments had already been approved by the teaching staff in the face of competition. That was in a talk that he gave to high school students, I think as an example. And this he always had, this idea of research done like a sort of workshop, you know, the sort of atelier from Renaissance, like in Italy. So I was a little skeptical about the big, the keeps big group, let's say. That was uh, inside, say, inside of himself. And here is the picture, the photo of Daniel Vess. He's a, a great instructor that was hanging in his office, always there. So Daniel Vess is a great physicist. And uh, on the right, you have the second paper by Ricardo that's uh, well known here, pairing vibration by Bess and Broglia. That was printed, that uh, was published 66. And uh, Francisco Barranco is the next talk is going to talk about pairing vibration. So we choose this also to have some continuity. So I'm going to say little about that, but the name of Broglia is often associated with say superfluidity, this kind of problem, pairing rotation, pairing uh, vibrations. So in a sense, it's sort of feel rouge that uh, goes through. And here, here is a great turn of his life because just on the footstep of Daniel Vest, he stayed first three, day, three years in uh, Copenhagen. And then after, uh, two years in the US, I uh, became staff. And this is Niels Bohr Institute. This is also dear to my heart because uh, I, that's where I also went in 84 and where I started to do nuclear physics and met him. So what is special after all So about this place? You see him here uh, with the tie in there. And uh, you see here, you see here there is uh, Motterson, here there is Ogebor and uh, several theorists and experimentalists that one could recognize. And it's him, but uh, this is a special place. And I remember when I went there, I, it was striking because I, you were there sharing the same auditorium where these guys were sitting in, in 1930. And it's really, it's really essentially the same place. You see, you recognize, I mean, that's the first, first row. But maybe if, even if you recognize Bohr, Eisenberg, Pauli, Jay Young, George Gamble, Landau, maybe you don't know very well about this instrument here. The trumpet to felicitate somebody if you had a good idea. And there you have a drummer boy to start the applause and even the cannon. The cannon was rather negative, let's say. So, so this is, you could in a sense perceive when you went there. And these are the two Bohrs. On the right, on the right, uh, and it's, it's So at the time, at the time, this was called uh, the uh, Institute for Theoretical Physics. That's the cover of the of the paper that gave essentially uh, Oge Boris Nobel Prize. And this is when he graduated. He was uh, pretty. I mean, he was over thirty at the time. Congratulated by his father. So father and son, both Nobel prizes. And here is here are, is, a, is a picture. It's also hanging in Ricardo's office of the two Nobel Prize. So that's a period where he went, became staff there. These are the two volumes of nuclear structure, and this is why why they were discussing. And that's fitting also. You see, you see the let's say behind the gauge of transformation. Let's say. So it's a proper figure. And in seventy five. Of course, they got the Nobel Prize. So this is the Nobel Prize to Ben Mottes, 65. So this is to give it just a flavor that uh, this was indeed a peculiar place. Again, let's see what he writes. In the morning of uh, October 4 in 65, I sat in a rather crowded auditorium, A, the one I show you in picture, of the Niels Bohr Institute to attend the first of a series of lectures on nuclear reactions which were to be delivered by Ben Mottelson. In the following spring term, Monday lectures were expected to deal with subject of nuclear structure and the lecturer to be Ogebor, as it usually happened. After Ben lecture, an experimental group meeting took place in which experimentalists said it was a praxis show their spectra. Likely not yet completely analyzed, while theoreticians attempted to find confirmation of their predictions. 
In the afternoon, I would continue with the calculation of variations I was carrying out in collaboration with Daniel Vess, as well as discuss with Klaus Riedel on how to use this information to work out two nucleon transfer differential cross-sections for lead isotopes, quantity newly measured at the Aldermaston facility by Ole Hansen and co-workers. Within this context, it did not seem surprising to me, nor to the rest of the attendees of Ben's lecture, as far as I recall, that reaction and structure went hand in hand <clears throat> to the extent that the practitioner aimed at checking theory with experiment. Given this background, reinforced through the years by my association with Oge Winter and Daniel Vess, aside from that with Oge Bohr and Ben Motteson, it is only nature that I view structure and reaction as the two inseparable faces of the same medal. So now, of course, every, I think now very often we talk about the connection between structure and reactions. And there, I say, at that time, was really one of the red thread all, all through all his career. So you see, this is a rather, rather well-known book he wrote with Zoge Winter. And then 20 years ago, last year, he wrote this other one that's also about reaction with this new collaborator, uh, uh, Gregory Potter. So this is, I put together, just to emphasize uh, this uh, uh, red thread. And here, here I just showed two, two, two papers that to show kind of things that they were doing. Here they were discussing, uh, they were discussing the interplay of, uh, let's say, a ground state correlation where you, the their effect on transfer and inelastic reaction. And on the right, you have, uh, I think it's, uh, this is sort of condensate, which is very useful also for experimentalists now. I put there, we put it, I put it on the web because it's not so easy maybe to find if somebody wants to download it. And that's a sort of, let's say, connection of all this work about the two-particle transfer. And it's written here in the first three lines, you say elementary modes of equitation as used here comprise collective rotation and vibration as well as quasi-particle excitation. That is a little bit the highlight of the physics in Copenhagen, uh, the physics behind the work of Bohr and Mottelson. So to how to understand reactions and structure on the basis of these uh, degrees of freedom. And uh, if you, maybe, maybe the most theoretically, say the most important achievement they could get in those years is the development of nuclear theory. So I know here I am, one of the talk about that, but say this is, I'm just saying, uh, this is uh, a, a, say, a many body, a many body technique that at least for two body interaction, now one could, could define as a, 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 a sense because it's uh, as precise as any other in principle, so it's an exact theory, where the, I mean, it's, uh, what, that is based on the fact that you couple, say, particle and vibration in a coherent way. Coherent means a coherent with the fact that the original fermion Hamiltonian, say single particle to body in the two body part, uh, to this part you add the particle vibration part. But, but of course, I write here, a set of rules is defined to take into account the over completeness of the nuclear basis, as well to respect the Pauli principle when you have the many body expansion. This I don't think is very well known. I think it's, it's interesting to look at the page of the paper by Peter, or the book by Ehring and Schuch, where you have discussion and you see also how it developed into other theories there. There are two nice pages. But this is, uh, in principle, it's a power technique, a powerful technique. And especially in this paper, it was explicitly shown the correspondence between fermion treatment and this treatment. So in a sense, this is sort, let's say, of Frelish Hamiltonian that you have in condensed matter for particle uh, cap, uh, vibration capping problem. But with the important thing that the, that the phonons that you create are excitation created, in, let's say, in a, consistently in RPA with your, let's say, two body interaction. So this is, as in fact, as if one would uh, dig as many connections, let's say, with self consistent green function method. But it's, uh, and uh, the problem is that has been developed in practice up to a certain point. But in those years, the real power was that uh, it converges fast. So this gave, is, gives a powerful technique to take into account, say, the coupling 
of a particle and phonon at the lowest order of perturbation. So the idea is that you could use the scheme to get the results that you can compare with data instead of, okay, having to sum same hundreds, hundreds of diagrams in the usual fermion expansion. So this was the power of the method that was applied in those years by Pier Francesco Bortignon, that I will going to say something more about him, essentially four things that are very dear to this meeting. So to understand the shade strength function, as well, especially the width of the collective modes that we are discussing today. So here you have the basic diagrams of a nuclear field theory with their interference pattern. And you see them here, this is the famous figure. And you see the, pro the point is that when you expand them, these diagrams, this gives you a reduction of the width as compared to the sum of the particle in the hole. So if you have a particle of excitation, then the width is not the sum of particle hole, but you have interference that depends very much on the spin and the multipolarity of your system. And then in case of surface aeration tend to suppress the width. And they, so this use this, this scheme to understand the coupling, the different sources of coupling, compound dumping, land down dumping, decay of proton to particles, um, say to, to more complicated configuration, let's say. And it's, uh, this is the conclusion of the paper. When they concluded, they calculated with are generally within a factor of two of the empirical values. However, there is a systematic tendency for the empirical dumping to be underestimated by theory. So this fact that the width tends to be a little smaller than in, ex than in experiment is already there in the, this paper. And then there was the concept of the always states. This paper was done with his two collaborators, Bersch and Bortignon. And uh, we find here also Bortignon. And so this particle vibration coupling then was uh, also investigated for other system uh, in collaboration with Claude Maho. I have this figure because for me, when I went to a sort of a iconic figure of particle vibration coupling, at least at that time, where you could see the basic effect that when you go from arc to Fock and you couple to surface low line modes, then uh, the final density of states, uh, you recover, you tend to recover the density of experiments, I would say that measure in experiments. That was one of the crucial things of the effect of single particle states of this coupling. And uh, it's suitable here uh, to talk a little about the Francesco Bortignon. The Francesco Bortignon left us in Milan a few years ago, and he was one of the closest collaborators of Ricardo. And uh, let's see what he writes, say, writes here. I vividly remember the sum, oh, summer of 1981, Santa Barbara, when we, Pier Francesco and myself, together with George Birch, wrote the review modern physics paper on the dumping of nuclear excitation. The initial remark of George regarding the project was something like, now there is something to review. He was referring to the recently published nuclear physics paper concerning the role of the nuclear surface on the dumping of nuclear motion, a paper in which Fra Francesco had demonstrated his mastery in the subtleties of finite many body techniques by identifying the doorway state to the compound nucleus, both for single particle motion and giant resonances. And they just refer to this paper, say, about the dumping of nuclear excitation and, uh, say, the behavior on single particle states. So this is precisely. Um, so Pier Francesco made a very important, uh, say, contribution together with Ricardo to understand, say, giant races in hot nuclei, something that Elena now is doing uh, very much, say, this, this is new and more modern techniques. But there, one of their contributions, say, was uh, just to, uh, say, to sample, to show that you could uh, uh, understand the trend, say, of the, of the width of the uh, giant dipole as a function of temperature by sampling, say, nuclei with a statistical ensemble where you could sample, say, different deformations and taking into account also the angular momentum. And uh, this was done in strong collaboration with the, uh, say, experimental group. So uh, this, this uh, let's say, book together, written together with Angela Bracco, 
testifies this. This figure is nice because you see the effect of the, in that this calculation of the effect of shell structure in the behavior of 110 10 to 10 and 208 lead that in one case uh, favors say the shell, the spherical shape rather than uh, say the deformed state. So this is certainly a very important uh, say set of contribution until he came to Milano in, uh, in uh, 1985. And he said it was called in Milano in a particularly say special way because so what we call the direct call for eye distinction. So it was a, some, an honor that is reserved to few people. And he writes, it might seem unnatural that I've left what is, was one of the most pre pre prestigious physics institutes. But he said, uh, I did not doubt in, 18, in 1986 or 85 that the time had come to move again. Basic scientific research needs only one thing in order to develop a positive atmosphere. And then he recalls the fact that in Denmark at that time, there was an anti-scientific say period and they lost all the position for young people at the Nisbor Institute in, uh, in Denmark. And then this, he wrote this in 2004 and he said the department as a, as a department of uh, physics of the University of Milan, I was able to create a theoretical nuclear physics group whose theoretical production, they was very optimistic, places today among the strongest on the world. Furthermore, I've been able to create an interdisciplinary group that deals with neutron stars, molecular aggregates, protein folding, and the design of unconventional drugs. So this, I think it was maybe over optimistic, but it shows the kind of things that he could, ex could expand becoming a leader of a group. And uh, also he doesn't say that here, but he loved teaching. So in, during that period, he had about say, I think he had 20, uh, 20 PhD students. Among those I would like to quote maybe Gianluca Colò, who has been with us for many years, of course, as a crucial role in, in the department. Then you have, I don't know, for example, Alessandro Pastore, who is now in France, Andrei Dini, who is Lund, and of course, other people that are in Milan. So this is, and that was also an active period, a very, very nice one, going through Copenhagen and Milano, because gamma ray spectroscopy, say, was in great development there. It was the time of ice spins, the time of super deformations. I collected here a few pictures, let's say, that are dear to the group of Milano. You see a young, uh, young Angel Bracco here that was to become. Uh, uh, say his wife. Then you see crucial, say, you see the collaboration between theory and the experimentalist. You see the two Nobel Prizes with Ben Teskin. Ben, Tes ben Teskin was a part of the experimental group of Milano Realism Star. That's reference point there, no? This, uh, the magician of, uh, let's say, the warm band I show you, or something like. And then you see, you see Ricardo talking at one of these parties of the time. You see again Ben Teskin with like Kuko Yamamoto. There, just another key person. <laughs> Here you see Thomas Dessing. Thomas Dessing was really the other theoretician behind this development. And uh, you see again Ben Teskin and uh, Silvia Leoni, who is now one of the key figures, say, for spectroscopy in Milano. And the young myself with Matsuo, that is, was a bright, a bright Japanese working on uh, this problem. It was a beautiful problem at that time where you could investigate say, the spectrum, the gamma ray spectrum arising from the decay of, uh, let's say, compound nucleus that you obtained, say, by fusion reactions. So we, the experimentalists could trace, thanks to the development, say, of more and more advanced, uh, say, gamma ray detectors, could make gamma gamma correlation to reveal these patterns. And uh, Ricardo had a particular role here because one, it was just in the say leading body of the Eurobol collaboration that I show you this document here with this signature as the only and the only theorist among uh, several uh, experimentalists. And uh, I don't know here that is, should I do something here or just start? I should I do start? Start? You think so? Okay. So this is, I, that, that is a very, uh, that's an important contribution that uh, Thomas Dersing, Roy and Lauritsen made at that time. I don't know if you know it, 
but this was this damping. We are used here to damping of vibration. No? That's, but then, then if you talk of uh, rotational motion, in a nutshell, the phenomenon is that when you couple, say, states to spin i to spin i minus two, if you had pure rotators, then all this trying to go to single final state. Instead, due to the fact that you mix states, because you have a residual interaction, when you probe states that are not very close, very close to the ground state, as I showed you before, the state mix, and then each one, all each one then goes to a final state, which is mixed, and the strength distribution that before was sharp lines become distributed over a width that is the rotational damping width. And you see this figure. This figure is a very nice theoretical, say, construct where you could see the lines uh, that are, uh, let's say, that uh, are connecting, say, excited bands. And here you could show you could show the dependence on the kind of interaction you had on the randomness of the interaction. You could work the chaoticity of the states with statistical, let's say, measure, comparing with the limit of Poisson Porter Thomas distribution and compare to experiment. And there, well, this is beautiful work that was led by Ben Terskin. That there, for the first time, you could really measure, let's say, correlation, gamma one, gamma two. And if you have fewer rotors, you would expect this regular band. And they were able to show in the spectra the spectra looks like uh, something in between, in fact. And from this depth of this valley, the, in principle, you should not have any count here. But if you have damp bands, this will have a certain depth. And there you can recover this important information about, let's say, mixing. Also at that time, at the time, of course, one of the big issues was to understand things that I remember that maybe quarrels with Peter Ring that was doing it in different fashion at some point, but about the role, let's say, of uh, pairing fluctuations. So when you, when you, of course, when you give angular momentum to your nucleus, the pairing, the pairing is killed, tends to be killed. But the fact how long it survive, how long you can trace, um, uh, say, the, uh, the, the energies as a function of a, a rotational frequency here. And you could see that if you include the fluctuations of the pairing gap, then you get very different result. Fluctuation meaning that when you calculate the standard BCS gap at some, as a function of frequency, that will go to zero due to the rotation, but, this, but you have a residual pairing remaining due to the fluctuation of the system. And you could measure at the time this, this kind of uh, correlation. Also at that time, I say our next speaker is this guy here, Francisco Barranco also, who uh, made his PhD uh, with, uh, uh, say in Copenhagen. So he studied with Ricardo and he was also collaborating with him until say a few months ago. At that time, I'm sorry, of course, of course I realized you know, I changed subjects it's not, it's not easy to, but I have to do it because as I said in the beginning, Broglia was a guy say, of diversified interest and I cannot avoid to quote some of, of this contribution. And this is, I think it's an, it's an interesting one that was very much related to George Bersh. So the idea that if you want to understand large amplitude motion, say the motion that goes, leads you, let's say to fission or to the emission of a cluster, let's say, of carbon, then you can understand in simple way by, say, thinking that you have, as a function of the formation, you will have many local minima, and that the nucleus will deform by jumping, having a probability, an amplitude to jump from one minimum to the other. This jumping, this hopping model, that then it will can follow as a function, let's say, of the formation looking at the sloping of the levels gives you in a natural and very transparent way an expression for the inertia of this collective motion. It's surprising this is extremely simple, but the idea is that all, all the time that you get the local minimum, the Fermi sphere will become spherical again. So this means it is the intuition, especially of George Birch, means that it gives you a criterion to give you 
how many crossings you are going to have when you want to change the shape. When you want to go from your initial radium 223 to this configuration where you emit a carbon protein. So this, in this way, this is a very simple collective state that mocks up something that is made more, much more complicated now. For example, in calculation by Aurel Bulga, he has to say. And also tells you that this pairing interaction is really acting like a sort of a lubricant of this interaction. Here, I do, but then I, I leave it, I leave it in the slides. But this is striking how well it reproduces quantitative the experimental lifetime for cluster decay. And that was also used for the decay of super bias or K isomers. At that time, at that time, Ricardo organized uh, about 10 schools. They were, I think I'm looking at Eduardo Lanza because we met there in Erice, one of those schools. I think it was very fun. <laughs> and I didn't resist to put here, let's say, a, a picture of Ricardo at Erice during one of these during one of the school with uh, her beloved daughter who was uh, freshly born, say. <laughs> and uh, yet, of course, yes, two kids with Angela. And uh, so that was very successful. He had several ones. I would just show this in particular. It was particularly dear to his heart, but in 97, I, I just here, you see the blend that he put together of uh, the condensed matter themes and nuclear matter, and uh, sorry, nuclear physics themes. And especially was very proud to have put together people that I show again in a minute. Let's see in the corner. You see Ricardo with Bob Schriff, Phil Anderson, David Brink, and George Bush. And out of that, of the three, became a, a funny paper here. Not say the most important of his say, scientific career, but you see the affiliation, Villa Monastero Varenna. I think it's quite nice. And George Bush had a big role also in this uh, scientific development. You see that uh, in uh, 2004, uh, Ricardo organized a meeting to give him, confer on him, Laura, Laura Honoris Causa in the University of Milano. And a few years later, he produced his book about say vibrations in, uh, in finite quantum system. Say, because yet, I, I show you before, then later something about this. And uh, I'm going now say in the, the second part of his uh, scientific career, he devoted much attention to this uh, problem say, of the influence connection between this particle vibration coupling we met before, but in the pairing channel. So the idea here is that also in nuclear theory, what it comes out when you have two, two particle problems, that you have a new source of attraction due to the exchange of low line vibrations. I think here we are all used, how many calculations are you seeing? Say BCS calculation, HFB calculation. So this is not, I think, uh, entered in the mainstream of the community, but what comes out, I think, from a consistent many body analysis is uh, that on top of the bare interaction, usual interaction that we are parameterizing in different ways, there is a dynamical important contribution coming from the coupling, say, of vibration. I think in some way also, Elena, you studied that with Peter Schuch in different, say, context. And uh, this is also, I mean, contained in this book with David Brink, Nuclear Superfluidity. And I think it's funny also that he was very angry, Ricardo, not very angry, I'm joking, but he was, I didn't like the fact that there was, when there was the anniversary of BCS, uh, they, they published a thick book, very beautiful on the other hand, where nuclear physics was completely ignored. There is no, practically no contribution about superfluidity in nuclear physics. So a reactive editing this book, 50 years of nuclear BCS. So we see many contribution inside here. So the idea is that this is, gives a sort of pay, uh, added uh, pairing interaction. This paper is very dear to me because uh, it's the only one that I co-author with Peter Schuch. So I think, uh, and there we could discuss and show that uh, the matrix element of this interaction, while you add on top of this, uh, of a bare interaction, tend to give you more attraction and uh, send you closer to the Gonyi interaction, which is known having say good empirical properties. So um, this is, and uh, you can then combine 
those, in, those um, pieces of particle vibration coupling consistently and doing something close to what is called, let's say, strong superfluidity in uh, condensed matter. So you have, uh, let's say, possibility of studying this phenomena with a, uh, let's say, modified BCS equation. The idea of modified, you see the BCS equation that you, I think you recognize it. If you put the quasi-particle strength to one, and here you put standard BCS, and here you have, let's say, Arctifog state, then you get the usual BCS equation. In this, uh, say, this is not a full theory, but in superflu is this, uh, let's say, um, simplified expression, then you can multiply the numerator by the quasi-particle strength because your state is mixed. So it has some spectroscopic factor, it is more than one. Then your energies are also modified by the self-energy. But then this on numerator, this BPP is more attractive because you have this other piece of interaction. And there you see, so this in this example, the red, the black dots are the usual BCS result of the usual BCS equation, the gap there. And then when you add these two terms coherently in this calculation, you get a larger gap. So this kind of say um, calculation, he did along say several years. And uh, I think for us, it's an important result. And that went hand in hand with big progress in the calculation of two particle trans. That was especially due to this uh, collaboration with Gregory Potel, that is a Spanish guy who came to Milano in around 2006. And then he, now we worked with him for 15 years. Now he has a position at Lawrence Berkeley interacting. I saw yesterday his contribution say that it's uh, so you, are using them in US, <laughs> but we keep a piece of his wave function. And thanks to the fact that finally, we could have a consistent scheme with a finite range DWBA and with formula that have been developed by Ben, May by ben Mayman in the 70s, it's a pity, because then all his computer codes was living in some cellar. So he had just, he came to Milano, he had, I remember, a sheet of paper that that long, <laughs> So with all the formula and the Gregory worked on it. And that's the result. So you have quantitative agreement with absolute cross-section. This is what was missing in the 70s. They had the say, say good agreement with the angular distribution, but the real uh, step forward for us was the possibility to have absolute cross-section. So, so this is published in a review paper. And uh, so we applied this theory to the structure and reaction of halo nuclei, especially reactions of uh, structure and reaction of lithium 11. There, <laughs> it's funny because there were papers that were saying, okay, I have lithium 11. Lithium 11, I have a core and two neutrons floating. So this should be, I mean, after all, rather close to free neutrons after all, why not? It turns out that it's just the opposite, that this is a damnly polarizable system, very difficult to understand how it's, how it's really taken together. And if you look at the literature, you almost invariably see that when you have to reproduce odd and even parity states, magically they introduce two different potentials. So you have potential for odd and for even states, but that's just, just there, they, you don't explain why. So the advantage of this is that with a unique potential, see unique potential, you have the renormalization of the states that gives you this uh, inversion that you find in beryllium 11, that's very well known there. And then you also have due to this extra, uh, the uh, extra interaction, you can explain, at least in this theory, the stability of this 11. So with only one potential, and uh, let's say using vibration that are of course taken from the phenology, you can explain also reactions. And this is a very important piece of physics that is not much, uh, say it's rather forgotten, but Tanihata made this beautiful experiment populating excited state into particle transfer, excited states of lithium nine. So take halo, say you have your halo flying, 11, the lithium 11. 
and populate the excited state of the core, lithium-9. So how you explain that? Our way to explain the population and the absolute cross-section was that uh, here you have a quadrupole correlation that is already built in the ground state of lithium-11. So it's thanks to this that you can populate this, it is a multiplated two plus, plus, plus two particles. So this is sounds, yeah, sounds technical, but it's not technical. It's a basic thing because when we talk about the structure of a of weakly bound system, this coupling with core degrees of freedom is essential to understand reactions there and also the structure. So this is, of course, has also connection with work made by many people here by Horst, for example, in other systems. So here, just to mention that among the different things, he also studied, say, I think it's very nice because it's the first calculation in the literature, and until now the only one, about the quantum structure calculation of the vortex in neutron star. I'm not going to, to dwell on it, but that's, of course, it's an important thing because vortices in neutron star play an important role, and there are no quantum calculation of this structure. I'm going to finish. Just mention briefly the fact that in Milano, now I cannot give justice to this because he spent a lot of time on this, uh, on this subject, but uh, two things. Again, again, he had in mind, say this idea of finite quantum systems, the nucleus, not by as itself, but as an example of quantum finite system. What it characterizes quantum finite system after all? is existence of a surface. Like that's the difference, not between the, compared to a uniform system and its vibration and its, and its coupling. And there you see, this is very nice. I mean, he applied to the theory of metal cluster, the same theory that I showed you before and that uh, Elena is doing for, let's say the dipole, <laughs> say the excited dipole, but he used, say, for the vibration of nuclear clusters. And that's the same idea, he sampled, Different, different, say, configuration, and they compare to actual experimental results. And there, of course, also to the vibration, that these are really phononic and plasmonic, uh, say, um, vibration in full rings. And that was collecting this book with Gianluca Colò, Giovanni Nonida, and Hector Roman. And he also did something important in Milano because he fostered uh, one of the first big, say, labs. The introduction in Milano, one of the big labs for cluster physics that that became, of course, this was done in the 90s. So then later at the boom, say, of this uh, cluster um, physics. And uh, I would recommend to you, this I have no time now, but if you have time and want to have a nice reading, go to this paper that is not in the new nuclear physics uh, literature. It was a special number of surface science and there I was comparing just say different, say physical system. You see here that the usual giant dipole resonance on the right, on the left, what he called, what happens in metal glass. So the surface plasma, you can compare it to say the oscillation of ions and the electrons say of a metal cluster with the giant his experience on giant dipole. And, and there you have a nice description of these effects that in finite, say in finite quantum system are related to the vibrations of the, of the surface, no? He said from time to time, say the particles set the surface into vibration. Vibration which can be reabsorbed by the same particle or by another particle. If it's the same particle, then the particle is modified. If it's another particle that gives you rise to this extra pairing interaction. This I, and uh, I, I will just conclude uh, about this. He spent a lot of time, maybe 15 years of his life more, about protein folding. Uh, the other, say, study of proteins, the other week I was talking to a very respectable and very smart, uh, say, nuclear physicist guy. I like him very much. And he said to me, that's strange. Why? Why is this physicist? He had other examples said in his mind. But why is this physicist who are good nuclear physics? So then so all of a sudden they go and think of doing something important in different fields. He said, but why? I mean, then in the end, you go there, you nobody knows you, 
uh, you are uh, you don't know all basic things, and you are going to give a very small contribution. And uh, well, well taken. <laughs> then uh, coming back, then I think of two things uh, that uh, Ricardo was saying. One thing was I've always done the same thing after all in all my life, and this is to his main collaborator. That's is imprinted in the head of his main collaborator about proteins. If you do something new, you have to play in Premier League. Well, that's the opposite then. Let's see. And in fact, in fact, uh, the two things are in fact true at what he writes. Because this fact of understanding, say, the, of course, the origin of life, if you want, is maybe uh, uh, very strong for anybody of us. But that protein folding problem, that is a fact that uh, can be expressed very simply. It's a big problem in uh, science. Big problem, you have a sequence of amino acids, very well known, linear sequence. How can they find in a very short time, say milliseconds maybe, or just uh, a, a specific three dimensional structure that's the only one that works to make us alive? This is completely useless for cell. only works if it has a particular folded structure. And this is a very, very hard thing to do ab initio, as people say now. If you have a molecular dynamic code, the best pseudo potential, it's essentially impossible to reproduce this folding. But he had in mind this analogy with nuclear physics. The analogy had in nuclear physics was that when you go, for example, from a spherical to a deformed system or from a normal to a superfluid system, yet this, this experience that they just a few neutrons in specific orbitals, hot orbitals, they determine this after all this quantum phase transition in small system. So he had in mind that the key would be to select out of this long chain, a series of few, few amino acids who are strongly interacting and do in a sense determine the time. Instead of being a, a, a coil going around in space, once in his movement, this basic local structure will be formed, then the protein would form. And this in his mind was deeply, deeply linked with say the experience he had in nuclear physics. It was not coming just because it was an interesting problem. And thanks to the collaboration with uh, uh, Guido Tiana, who is now a professor in Milano, then he went on and I was saying before about playing in Premier League. So he went to this uh, Eugene Shaknovich. This Shaknovich is one of the boss of this, of this uh, say field because Shaknovich had an idea of this kind. So, I mean, he spent a long time and uh, to, to work on this model and see if his idea could work. And usually you don't do, say, spin-offs when you are 70, you do it when you are 20, hopefully. But he did do it. So he created with uh, this, uh, say, medical company here, this spin-off called Foldless. And this idea of spin-off after all, it's very simple. If you have this local structure, would be just here, the, maybe this uh, specific amino acids. If you can create a small molecule, just small one, and you target this specific structure, that will block the folding. So his idea, his dream, would be, let's say, to try to help in the treatment of AIDS, because the AIDS express a protein. And if you block it in this way, it would give a big contribution. Of course, this is optimistic side. Then, of course, this didn't work. So in a sense, say from this spin off, I think in the end didn't work. And when I ask uh, Guido Tiana why it didn't work, I think his reply, you know, the usual uh, joke about the physicist in the cow, what is the cow for a physicist in a sphere? I think he had more or less the same attitude, he under evaluates the problem that the biology experiment are not like physics experiment. Physics experiment, you always hope that your partner will do maybe better in three years, reduce the error bars, but there it will be a mess. So you need a lot of good people, a lot of practice. And I think they could not, they could never establish in practice if this idea was uh, real, really working.
or not. But then we thought Jana is working on proteins that is doing a lot of nice things. So this is just to give you at least a glimpse that it was not an experience, they just, uh, just uh, fall, fallen down by heaven. So I have concluded with one final point, if I let it just take uh, two minutes, two minutes, then, but this I will be very brief. But if I, I try to highlight a few people who are very significant for uh, Ricardo Broglia, I show you the two Nobel Prizes, George Bersh, then uh, Francisco Barranco, Gregory Potel, this kind of strong collaborator. But he had also another star in his system that was uh, P.W. Anderson, say the condensed matter physicist and the Nobel Prize, the one that was one of the great physicists of the century, say, and, and I don't know if people here uh, know about, say, about this paper, more is different. This more is different is what it just, it's a paper of 72 that was extremely influential and in, uh, for a big community and discusses something very important, I think for our community, that is this contracts in a sense between emergent property versus reductionism. So this I'm flying a little bit higher <laughs> this last minute about something I don't really control very well. But now this has very much to do with our discussion about ab initio, or I just show you in the beginning that of course he was an old man in a sense because he believed in this say approach of Bore Mottelson based on elementary degrees of freedom. These elementary degrees of freedom are building are essentially phenomenological. So they are essentially single particle states and vibrations taken from experiment. And then on top of this, you construct a theory. So this is, okay, sense just the extreme of the other attitude that, uh, that uh, Anderson was saying in the first line. I think it's accepted without, without question that we say that uh, uh, the working of everything in the universe are controlled by the set, same set of fundamental laws. And then this is the idea. You have something of initial and you can construct on top of it. So this... I put here in these slides because I am not going to be about that, but I think that it's, if you go there and read it, Anderson was talking about the nucleus. He was talking about, say, at that time, 72, the fact fundamental for him that the discovery understanding of collective rotation by Bohr and Mottelson is something, as he said, that would never be impossible to find on the basis, say, of a uh, fundamental uh, calculation in the sense that you know a basic force. We had to come, had to come by, say, an inspiration based on everyday intuition, which suddenly fitted everything together. So this is also the attitude towards BCS. So the fact that when you have a radical change of that, it's an emergent property. It's something that goes beyond what can be found by, uh, let's say, uh, I will say ab initial calculation. And this to me, it's in a sense, say it's something just rethinking of his activity. It's something, it's an open problem. It's an open problem. I would like to finish then with this figure here that for us was very nice because this is the spectrum of beryllium 11. This is a beautiful calculation by Navratil and others that for the first time could reproduce ab initio this inversion, this parity inversion I mentioned before. And uh, I would like to compare it with our, say, very simple calculation based on, let's say, these elementary degrees of freedom I showed before. And both things, both things give you uh, the same spectrum experimental. And I think that to me personally, I think that to view, let's say, say physics, say this different viewpoints is really very something that we have to do, let's say, because it gives you more predictive power but also more understanding. So we need, I think, both things uh, very much. And I think this is one of the messages I would say that I would take from the scientific activity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, it was a little long. <laughs>